Compromise and time are the two main ingredients in successful conflict resolution. Whether in personal life or in politics, time does heal wounds and offers the space for solutions to emerge. Unfortunately, in dealing with climate change, which should actually be called global heating, time is not on our side. Time is against us. We are running out of time. Also, normal conflicts can be resolved through dialogue and compromise, not so global heating. Nature does not negotiate. Nature also does not compromise. I have spent the past several months learning about global heating and have come to the conclusion that, apart from nuclear war, it is the most critical challenge facing humanity. What is the problem? A good way to approach the question is to take a step back and to look at the issue from a distance. Please accompany me on a thought experiment. Let us assume that a curious and benevolent extraterrestrial visitor, I will call him Lux, will come to Earth every century or so. In the 8,000 years of human civilization, Lux did not see any change. For 97% of the time, everything was steady. Suddenly, about 200 or so years ago, an explosive transformation took place. Until the late 18th century, energy sources were human and animal muscle power, water, wind, and wood to burn. Then came coal. It powered the Industrial Revolution and then mass transport across oceans and continents. Until the 1950s, coal was the world's foremost fuel. Then came oil. It made possible individual mobility, airplanes, urban as well as suburban development, and modern industry. Energy, fossil fuels to be precise, shaped the modern world. Extraterrestrial Lux, when coming back to Earth in the 20th century, thought he had landed on the wrong planet. He could not recognize it anymore. Science had flourished, industries had emerged, agriculture had become mechanized, cities had expanded, and the world population had grown phenomenally. Economic productivity had exploded, all in a matter of decades. Although the human species has emerged about 150,000 years ago, most of the growth and change that has ever happened, as you can see, was in the last 60 years. It took several millennia to reach the first billion humans around the year 1800. It took another 100 years for the second billion after World War I in 1920. It took 40 years for the third billion around 1960 then 14 years to the fourth billion, 13 to the fifth, 12 to the sixth, eight years to the seventh billion, and today we are 7.6, and we will be, it's not even on the chart, we will be 11 billion by the end of this century. Also in the last 60 years, many people, not all to be sure, have become beneficiaries of the rise in productivity, have become healthy and materially well-off to an extent previously unthinkable. Humans now have extraordinary levels of power at their disposals. A small car uses the muscle strength of well over 100 horses. The heating and lighting of our houses, often palaces by previous standards in, times of, in terms of size and comfort, our washing machines, dishwashers, fridges, freezers, electronic gadgets, use the equivalent of the energy output of many dozens of people. Yet, the wealth and energy consumption of the West is staggering, not so in Africa, Asia, Latin America, but as the saying goes, there is no free lunch, and there is, because nature is finite, there is also no planet B. Interestingly, in the 1960s, people were getting concerned about pollution and the reckless exploitation of non-renewable resources that they feared would inevitably lead to a Malthusian nightmare of famine. They were right. Pollution was tackled very successfully. The air, 
the rivers, the lakes, cars, and the cities and the industries became much, much cleaner. But on the second point, depleting natural resources, something interesting happened. Modern technology opened up previously inaccessible deposits and created synthetic substitutes so that supply was assured and prices even dropped. It emerged, surprisingly, that the problem of humanity's interaction with nature is less the depletion of raw materials and more the consequences of using the raw materials. Today, there is a glut, not a shortage, of fossil fuels, and the formidable challenge is to leave the, them where they are, namely in the earth. Burning fossil fuels, coal, oil and natural gas, generates carbon dioxide, which is an odorless, invisible, heat-trapping gas. In a nicely descriptive manner, it is called a greenhouse gas. A greenhouse is warm even in winter, because it lets the sunshine in and traps the warmth. It has been understood for decades that a warming climate knocks nature off its balance and changes the environment. Melting ice in Greenland and the Arctic causes sea levels to rise, deserts are spreading, water shortages become common. You have heard the story of Cape Town running dry. The weather generally becomes more extreme, hotter, drier, wetter, and stormier. Warming in grey Middle Europe might sound quite attractive, but that is an illusion. Think of it more like body temperature. Around 37 degrees Celsius is normal, 38 degrees is a fever, and after that alarm bells ring. Same for nature. Higher average temperatures change, possibly destroy nature's equilibrium. A warmer Earth will be horrific, quite like a feverish human body. Many life forms will be endangered. And there is evidence that warming is a major driver of the terrifying events of the past year, such as the floods in Bangladesh, droughts in Africa and Asia, hurricanes in the Caribbean, as well as in the southern United States, and the horrible wildfires in California and Canada. The damage attributable to natural disasters last year in the US alone was over $300 billion. Obviously, the costs and the disaster of the disasters will rise unless warming is halted and reversed. Many people ask if it is proven that carbon dioxide causes warming. In the scientific community, there is absolutely no doubt about it. There is consensus just as there is consensus about the connection between a high-calorie diet and obesity, or between exposure to noise and deafness, or between the availability of guns and gun-related deaths. I'm using these examples because there are still a few people who dispute these connections, but there are also people who think that the sun revolves around the earth or that the earth is flat. Well, the earth is not flat, it's a ball surrounded by the atmosphere, a 100 kilometer high layer of gases, of which carbon dioxide is the most prominent. Carbon dioxide is like a blanket that lets infrared radiation pass through, but prevents, like in the greenhouse, the warmth of the Earth to escape back into outer space. The dynamic admitting the sun's rays but trapping the warmth leads to a higher global surface temperature. A vicious feedback loop results. Higher atmospheric levels of carbon lead to ever higher temperatures. Unlike, say, steam, which evaporates, carbon dioxide accumulates and it lingers in the atmosphere for centuries. Present day levels of carbon dioxide, therefore, are the result of both cumulative emissions since the Industrial Revolution and current ones. Picture a bathtub with water gushing in and the drain blocked. The water level rises unless the faucet is turned off or unless water is scooped out with a bucket. The connection between CO2 emissions and warming has been known in the scientific community since the time of Napoleon, 
but it was the US scientist Charles Keeling in Hawaii in an observatory called Mauna Loa, who in the 1960s alerted the world to the man-made contribution of the greenhouse effect. He stipulated that higher emissions lead to higher concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, and this is measured in parts per million. You see this in the vertical axis. For hundreds of thousands of years, atmospheric levels of CO2 have been between 180 and 280 parts per million. They are now over 400 and they keep rising. The Earth has warmed about one degree Celsius and keeps getting warmer. This is as if the human body temperature had gone from a normal 37 to 38 and being on track to being higher still. 2016 set a record of CO2 emissions. It was the first year that atmospheric levels exceeded consistently 400 parts per million. It was also the hottest year ever recorded following on the record-breaking year 2015, which in turn came after the so far hottest year 2014. And 2017 is right up there. The aggregate emissions of the past two centuries, to put it in context, from 1751 to 1950, were less than those of the past seven years. Extraterrestrial luck stands in amazement. Humanity is heading straight for a catastrophe unless the flow into the bathtub is stopped and event is reduced and eventually stopped. Or if a way is found to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Scientists are working frantically on carbon removal techniques or carbon capture and storage, but to date, no effective scalable solution has been discovered. Reducing carbon emissions, not just slowing them down, is extremely hard, not scientifically, but politically and economically. Decades of diplomacy preceded the Paris Conference of December 2015, at which all countries of the world solemnly committed to holding the increase in global average temperature below 2 degrees Celsius or even 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Chancellor Angela Merkel last November at a conference in Bonn called climate change the central challenge for humanity. She was right. The Paris Agreement is a major achievement in defining the problems and in, and in outlining the tasks ahead. Unfortunately, Mapping the journey is not the same as actually moving forward. As matters stand, what was agreed in Paris has a probability of more than 90% to exceed 2 degrees and a very likely chance of, exceed, of increasing the temperature to 3 degrees Celsius, which is deeply worrying. Global warming is the side effect of a stunning success which, it now turns out, also has a colossal downside because it collides with the physics of a finite world. The challenge will be for humanity to show the same creativity going forward as the one that brought us here. Climate policy is not rocket science, it is actually much harder. It is harder because the status quo works for many countries that export oil, and gas companies that produce cars with internal combustion engines, cities that enjoy tax revenues, people who have jobs and the convenience of mobility and comfort, and 50 euro flights to Mallorca, and so on. Our lifestyle is considered normal and acquired right, and it is uncomfortable to acknowledge that the Earth cannot support everyone living like we do. But it clearly cannot, especially not with a world population rising by another 50%. A big obstacle to climate neutrality is that the atmosphere has no ownership. Polluting it costs nothing. Energy prices reflect the scarcity as well as the supply and demand of energy, but not 
environmental costs. If there were a real price on carbon emissions, industries and consumers would react and shift to less carbon intensive goods. It is like the shopping carts at supermarkets. If you charge 50 cent, they all come back. If you don't charge, you can pick them up all over the place. But change obviously is unpopular, and this helps those who benefit from the status quo. The politics of staying the course wins votes, at least in the short run. Advocating change does not. Also, politics is local and in the present, whereas global heating transcends borders and ranges far into the past and the future. Those who will suffer, the poor in the global south, future generations and those other species, cannot vote. The costs of doing something against global heating are direct and immediate, while the benefits accrue in the future, and also to those who do not contribute to the reduction of carbon emissions and those who take a free ride. The politics is further complicated by the fact that the interests of countries are not aligned and everyone thinks that the other should go first or do more, or that um, it's not yet, the time is not right, and maybe the science is unsettled. So the, huge, the obstacles are huge, but they need to be overcome. On the other hand, global heating is also an opportunity for the emergence of modern, clean industries, fulfilling jobs and social inclusiveness, but it will not happen automatically. Think, once the telephone was invented, the Morse code was obsolete. And once self-dialing was possible, phone operators' jobs were doomed. Same today, attempts to defend the coal industry or the internal combustion engine will end badly. Endless growth in a finite world is a fantasy, foundering on the shoals of nature and fairness. The science exists, the resources are there, and the way forward is more or less clear. Open is if humanity can organize itself to do what it must before time runs out. What are the solutions? Well, they are political, psychological, technical, economic. All must work in tandem, citizens, scientists, politicians, industrialists. Climate change is an issue beyond politics. It is not a green project, it's not a conservative project, a left-wing, an American, German, European, Chinese or whatever project, but an endeavor to preserve humanity as we know it. Either the whole world wins or no one. The next decades will be time of discovery, innovation and investment. Politically and economically, the most important step is to put a high price on carbon. Massive investments will have to be made in research and technology, also in energy-saving housing, production, transportation and food chain. Renewable energy sources could and hopefully will wean the world of its addiction to fossil fuels. Taking CO2 out of the atmosphere must be developed and introduced at scale. Of course, it would help if less meat were eaten and more locally and sustainably grown plant products. In short, what needs to be done is no mystery, and most of us feel it in our bones, even if we struggle with admitting it. The challenge needs to be tackled head-on, expeditiously, audaciously and tenaciously, for the benefit of this beautiful world and for all of us who come all of those who come after us. So extraterrestrial Lux is undoubtedly looking forward with great interest to his next visit, and with any luck, he will discover that humanity has developed the scientific and political smarts to save life as we know it. Thank you. Thank you.